Dear friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it is an honor for me to have got a chance to present to you some ideas of mine about the idea of philosophy of history in this remarkable place in your university. You know that this university has just given me the honor of an honorary doctorate. And a little bit of my gratitude is this presentation, only a very little bit. I will speak about meaning and absurdity in history, and I would like to present you an idea what a future directed philosophy of history could be. Let me start with a provocation, with a quotation by James Joyce of his great novel Ulysses from 1977. History is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. And we historians do what we can to let the people awake from this nightmare. But before they can awake, they have to know something about the dark sides of history. And this is what I want to take into consideration this night. I will not speak only of the black side of history, but I will not let it out. I will integrate it. And this is what I think we have to do after the crimes against humanity in the 20th century, which had opened our eyes for this dark side, we have to realize if we want to teach history in a way that the people become moved into a better future. Now let me start with the first point. What are the challenges for historical thinking today? I list up how many are there? I think six. First of all, we have to realize traumatic historical experiences um, in the recent past, but the recent past uh, has opened, uh, should have opened our eyes that these crimes against humanity happened all over the course of time in the past. Of course, the most radical and challenging experience of this kind of trauma in historical experience is the Holocaust. But the Holocaust is only an example, an extreme example, that the Holocaust should have opened our eyes and then we look around and you find a lot of traumatic experiences all over space and time. The second challenge is the necessity for the new intercultural communication. In the age of um, globalization, the different traditions and cultures and civilizations come closer and closer and they learn that only if they can communicate with each other that they have a common uh, future perspective of hope. In the academic discourse about history, human culture, humanity, the idea of difference and diversity is dominating. And that's a funny thing. We live in a time where everything comes close together, but the academics, they are thinking about differentiation, that we are different and difference and individualism is the dominating issue. So there is a kind of an unsolved problem uh, that can't be the last word of the academics that we are different and the diversity uh, is um, the main thing we have to realize in the humanities. And this is, uh, you can put that together under the title of postmodernism. Postmodernism is a comprehensive trend in the humanities emphasizing pluralism and relativism. This is not a solution, but a question and a challenge we have to meet. Additionally to this trend of postmodernism, we have a very powerful trend now which is called post-colonialism. And here, post-colonialism 
states a negative meaning, uh, namely that the hitherto developed ideas of history and historical research and history as an academic discipline, which mainly have come upon in the West, are the wrong way of meeting intellectually the past and we have to skip it, to throw it overboard and look for alternatives. And this is reflected on the level of meta-history, of thinking about history, of theory of history. Here, the main trend is that there is no history in the past. Everything is constructed by the present. The past has nothing to say to the people in the present. Only we, people in the present, say something about the past, and that means what we like to know and to hear and forget about the rest. And then the last uh, challenge is my observation that in the academic and in the public discourses about culture and cultural orientation of today, the prefix post is dominating. Post-modernity, post-capitalism, post-rational, post-humanistic, post-racial. I have a list uh, with a lot of um, uh, findings, uh, about 20 and more, these posts. What do they mean? Then if people put themselves in the course of time, post something. Mm -hmm. That means they have lost the ground of historical experience under their own feet. They are hanging in the air, we would say in German, and this is not the way of the cultural orientation by historical thinking which is necessary to find a place in the changes we call history, if they have happened in the past, but we, the changes of our present experience, which, only, which we can only stand by historical thinking. Now, after having indicated a challenge, the next step is to look for an answer. What is the issue? Let me start with a very fundamental definition what history is about. History is a meaningful relationship between past, present and future. Don't forget the category of future in doing history referring to the past. It is con constituted by criteria of meaning. I give you only examples, the idea of progress, teleology of origins, historia, vitae, magistra, and so on. So, this criteria of meaning and sense, you have this wonderful Portuguese word, sentido, which comes very close to the German word sense. In English, uh, you can't say that. Meaning is much weaker. Be that as it may, these criteria have come into a fundamental doubt. And the place to discuss this doubt and overcome it is philosophy of history. Now, what is philosophy of history? And before I start going into the details, first of all, we have to see and to realize that there is no one philosophy of history, but three completely different ways of doing it. And this is a problem, that we have three forms of philosophy of history which exclude each other, and this is a point. So, the oldest one of these three forms of philosophy of history is called material philosophy of history, and the best examples are Kant, Hegel, Marx, theory of social or cultural evolution, Karl Jaspers, Schmuel Eisenstadt and a lot of other people who tell you the general trends in the past of the change in human life in a very fundamental and comprehensive dimension. The second form of philosophy of history is a formal philosophy of history. In the 19th century it was developed as an alternative to the material philosophy of history by people like Rickert, Simmel, Diltai. Today it's uh, this kind of philosophy of history, a theory of narration, and the most prominent representative is Hayden White. And there is a third 
way of doing philosophy of history which is till today even not realized as a kind of philosophy of history, namely philosophy of history as a theory of memory and commemoration. I call it a functional philosophy of history, not the material, not the formal, but the functional one. And here the prominent people are Maurice Halbwachs, Pierre Nora, the memory discourse of in the last 20 or 30 years, in Germany the most prominent uh, scholar here is Jan Asman and his wife uh, Alida. These three modes of philosophy exclude each other and this is a problem. They should not exclude each other, they have to be mediated with each other because they are sides or dimensions of the same issue of what history is about. Therefore, we have to overcome this exclusive interrelationship in favor of an intermediation and a synthesis of them. As I said, the general issue is meaning. What makes meaning? What makes sense uh, in uh, referring to the past? And here, I have to address a very important point, namely the tendency in the humanities and social sciences that the meaning or the sense of history is only a construction. And this is only half of the truth. And I want to emphasize that there is another half we have overlooked. Now you can see at the screen that it is of course true that the people of the present construct the meaning of the past by putting their values, their hopes, uh, their threats, and so, into their relationship to the past. This is true. But what is overlooked in the construction uh, theory, in this um, um, dominating constructiveness, that the people who construct are already constructed, by the context within which they do their work. And in this context, the past is present. Because the past ends in the condition and in the form of present day life. So, the past is already a partner, an element, a determinator, if you like it, in the process of construction. And in order to know what bringing about meaning in history is, we have to realize that there is not only a construction, but a constructedness. And we have to think both together. That makes the work of philosophy of history rather difficult. Now, to underline and to emphasize this difficulty, I would emphasize that this work of dealing with meaning and giving meaning and accepting or being uh, determined by a pre-given meaning, we should distinguish three different levels of forming meaning in history. In my uh, explication and presentation of these three different levels, just for those who know a little bit the discussion of theory of history, I'm following uh, arguments by Paul Ricoeur in his famous work, uh, Time and Negative uh, and Narrative. So let me start with the most fundamental level of forming meaning, namely the functioning. Here, it is the context determining uh, the cultural uh, present elements. I would call it an objective meaning that is already there as a fact. And the most, uh, what do I say, the most objective and the most powerful pre-given meaning in the, pro in, the, in, the, in, the, in the processes of historical consciousness and uh, meaning construction is language. But it's not only language, it is what from the, the, the babies uh, till the elderly people, they live in a world full of history objective history, it is there. And that is the functioning level 
we have to realize if we look uh, at the practice of meaning formation in historical culture. And there is a second level that is in a, in a, in a certain way just the contrary of the first one, the level of reflexive forming of meaning. Here, the intellectuals, the poets, the historians, and all those people who are busy in giving the experience of the past a meaning for the present. Here, it's our work, the historians uh, and the philosophers, on this level. And here, constructivism is, of course, the issue. Constructivism is the case. And there is a third level, namely uh, the level where the functioning and the reflexive practice of meaning, of forming meaning, are intermediated. Here you find, for instance, history teaching in school. People who want to introduce results of the reflection on the reflexive level into the real social life of the people. Here, politicians are very powerful to, uh, let's say, to influence what is taught uh, in school about the past or what kind of monuments were built and museums. These three levels are interrelated and if we really want to know what the process of forming meaning in history is, we should address the difference and the interrelationship of these three levels. And now uh, I have to address the uh, necessity of synthesizing or mediating these three different dimensions of philosophy of history as they take place on the different levels in a different uh, extension. So, what is the mediation? What is the starting point for our task to mediate these three dimensions? A very simple insight, a very simple truth, namely that function mediates content and form. So, there is already logically on a very basic level, how should I say that, a pre-given mediation if we see that the functional aspect can only be understood as a mediated relationship of content and form. Now this is only a very formal argumentation. Now what about the concrete realization of this mediation? Uh, what conditions should be fulfilled if a mediated philosophy of history is good for our time? Now my answer is it must be a universalistic approach to the past which covers the whole diversity of cultural difference in space and time. So, we have to start with asking for anthropological universals. This is the intellectual philosophical answer to the experience of globalization and cultural difference of today. So, I will just give you only a, a sketch of this anthropology of philosophy of history of this new form. You know, traditionally, philosophy of history was a Western issue. It was invented by Monsieur Voltaire, and then uh, it was brought about by the Scottish Enlightenment and by some German philosophers like Kant, Herder, uh, Schlitzer, and others. So, that is Western. So the intellectuals today said they are Eurocentric. And this is not uh, this is indeed a problem. Therefore, we should start with universalistic issues, universalistic principles, and that is we should start 
with anthropological universals. And don't believe the anthropologists <laughs> who tell you that such universals down don't exist. That is absolutely nonsense. Of course they exist. There is a very strong intellectual academic research in anthropological universals. And here is a starting point for a new philosophy of history which is able to cover the, the wide field of cultural diversity in space and time. At least I want to make you curious to know more about these anthropological universals. So I can uh, only give you some hints. The idea comes from Reinhard Koselleck. He developed in his meta history the idea of uh, the Bedingungen der Möglichkeit, conditions of possibility of history. That is a very philosophical, very transcendental idea. Bedingungen der Möglichkeit, conditions of possibility. I say, okay, that's good for philosophers. It's transcendental argumentation. Let's be a little bit more realistic and make of these conditions of possibility anthropological universals. You can say that. Koselek, for instance, presented in his article seven of these conditions of possibility. I mention only three. The difference between internal and external. That is universal for all human life forms. People belong to you, other people don't belong to you. Other, with some people you live together, with other people you don't. And this is universal. The other is above and below. There are always people above you. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the highest, I don't know who that is, the Catholics would say mm, the Pope, but I don't think so. Even uh, the American president is not the highest, but you know what I mean. There are people who give commands, there are other people who have to obey. This is universal. And uh, a third one is the difference between friend and foe. That is universal. And so Kozelek presented seven of these universals. That is not so much, um, and uh, the, for the whole field of historical experience, it is uh, too little. So I enlarged it to 17. But I, don't be um, uh, afraid. I will not speak about the 17 anthropological universals. Uh, I only can say, if you would like to know more about it, there is a nice book translated by my friend, <laughs> Stevao Martins on Meta History, where I have listed up all these universals. And that is an open list. So that is not a closed list. And it is a construction, so you can at any time do it in a different way. But the conditions are clear, they must be universal. And the point is that all these universals are tensions, contradictions. The relationship between above and below is full of conflict. It is full of blood. The same is true for internal and external. You can say male and female good and evil, and so on and so on. It is a source of conflict and problems. And this set of anthropological tensions bring human life wherever it takes place into a temporal movement. Because the people have to struggle with these tensions they have to give their meaning and they have, to, they have to strive for this meaning and that is the reason why the human world has a very specific temporality. 
You can call the, the, these anthropological lists, this list of anthropological universals, an anthropological generator of historical time. Temporal change is not history. So we have to argue a step further and go beyond Kozelek's uh, ideas. Because Kozelek only makes clear what the specific temporality of the human world is about. But temporality is not already historicity. What makes change or what what, what makes out of change history. There must be a moving element in the temporal development of different human life forms which have a direction. A direction we can, ref we can pick up and relate it to ourselves. And then we have a meaningful relationship between past, present, and our future, and that is history. What is this element? The answer to this question is the word meaning. The people who have to live these tensions, who have to organize their life in the struggle between internal and external, above and below, and rich and poor, and so on and so on, they have to give it a meaning in order to make it livable. And this meaning always goes beyond the pre-given life conditions of the people. They have an element of transcendence. For thousands of years that was religion. But uh, religion is not only this going beyond the horizon of the pre-given life form of the people, there are others. And to make, to pick up this moving element of meaning going beyond the horizon of the real life conditions of the people have to be referring to us. And this is what we do in thinking about this past. Um, and then temporal change gets a direction. And then we can go, pick up all these elements of meaning. For instance, uh, above and below. What is the meaning of it? It is called legitimation. If it is legitimate, the people accept it and they can live it. And legitimation has always an unrest in itself. We can feel it ourselves if we have to live in this tension between above and below. If you have to pay a ticket to a policeman, you feel the unrest in yourself. Mm -hmm. You say something should not be the case. Uh, we should uh, liberate ourselves. I don't know what. They are full aspects of hope, threat, and so on. And the historians have to, have to refer this transcendence of meaning to the present. And then you have the idea of a development. And then you can go through all these sense criteria, justice, what is the sense criteria of friend and foe? Peace. Peace. And the transcendence is eternal peace, as Immanuel Kant has written it. And so you can go on. Poor and rich. What is the, 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 um, the, the principle? That the people in the difference between poor and rich nevertheless can live their lives. So then you can accept it and say, yes, as long as I have enough for my family, it is legitimate. At the very moment, if that is not the case, then uh, there will be unrest and a change in the uh, human life. This is what makes out of temporal change 
historical development. Now there is a question now, can we put all these temporally directed principles of meaning the people no, uh, need in order to live their lives in the context of these various tensions? And my answer is yes. What brings legitimacy, eternal peace, justice, and all the other principles of cultural meaning in human life, what brings them together? Can we find a kind of a, of a meta-concept? And my answer is yes. That concept is humanity. And so, from the anthropological universals and the um, temporality to the historicity at the end, this philosophy of history proposes an idea of a general development of different human cultures into the same direction. So, in fundamental perspective, history is a universal process of humanizing humans. Now only a few words to the two other dimensions. We need an anthropological universalism in the formal philosophy of history. And indeed, they exist. Namely, the universalistic uh, types of narrative meaning of the past a universalistic typology of historical narrative. You can find it um, in some of my articles. There are four types of making meaning of the past, thus transforming its experience into history. The traditional meaning, the exemplary meaning, the critical and the genetical one. And um, the, these types of narrative meaning are universal. You find them in all cultures, in very different constellations, and so they can synthesize with this idea of a general development of um, human life forms. And to say uh, a, a few, one word to the functional element, what is the most important function of history? presenting the people their own identity. And here, identity means that they have to learn what it means that they are humans. In the perspective of these three intermediated dimensions of philosophy of history, historical thinking has got a humanistic face. And that was the beginning of modern historical thinking. In the beginning of modern historical thinking, at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, historical thinking was thoroughly humanistic. The best representative I have in mind is Johann Gottfried Herder, but there are a lot of other intellectuals who had the same intention. Now, I can stop now here and say, let's have come back to the origin of a humanistic historical studies, and we are very happy. But what about absurdity? And unfortunately, I have to add one point to this return of our origin, namely absurdity and meaning. Now, my last point then is, what about absurdity? We all know what absurdity in history is, as long as we are able to open our mind for a certain kind of historical experiences, namely of traumatic experiences. The most speaking paradigm and example for this traumatic experience, at least for the Jews and the Germans, and a lot of other people who were involved, is the Holocaust. But this kind of Radical inhumanity is an issue in all historical developments and that we should not overlook. 
There was a very in, uh, interesting debate between Saul Friedländer and a German historian, uh, historian Martin Borchardt, about the Holocaust, where Friedländer said, the history of the Holocaust can't be done in the same way as we do the history of Portugal in the 17th century. I commented this correspondence and said, yes, but after having realized the traumatic character of the Holocaust, we can't go on and do the history of Portugal in the 17th century as we have done it till now. We have to change our attitude. And the question is, how can that be done? Historians who have to refer to this experience give it a meaning. If you say a single sentence about it, it has a meaning. They write books, 800 pages and more, and say the Holocaust has no meaning. The Holocaust can't be explained. And then they present us on 800 pages, 800 pages, a meaningful narrative. And this is not very, uh, how should I say that, we can't be content with it. We have to ask for the possibilities of integrating meaninglessness into the meaning formation of historical thinking. This is what we have to do. Do we, ha do we have any examples <coughs> what it means to integrate meaninglessness or absurdity into a meaningful presentation of something? We don't have it in historiography, as far as I know. But in fine art, we have it. Think of Euripides, the Trojan women, Shakespeare's King Lear, Kafka, Beckett, and in the film, Claude Lanzmann's Shoah. Here, and I can go on, you have examples that it is possible to integrate absurdity into a meaningful narrative. And this is what we in historical studies still have to bring about. And I can give you only one example of a prominent historian of today who did a step into this and presented a very impressive work where the meaninglessness of the Holocaust it has become a part of a highly meaningful history of the Holocaust, that is Saul Friedländer's uh, two-volume work, Nazi Germany and the Jews. What are the consequences of this step into a new way of historical thinking and representation, integrating absurdity into the meaning presented by historical historiography, by historical presentations. We have to change something in the attitude of our historical thinking. I would say at least two things have to be brought about. The first is we need a new category fundamental concept in historical thinking, absolutely fundamental and anthropologically universal. All historiography is dealing with human activity, more or less human activity. But people do not only act and do something, people suffer at the same time, and suffering is as fundamental and constitutive for the human world than acting and doing. Go into the library and look for the, all the encyclopedias and dictionaries of history and the social sciences and look for activity, acting. You will find a lot of books and uh, literature, action theory. And then you look into the, uh, the, uh, the dictionaries for suffering. 
What will you find? In the German dictionaries, dictionaries, you know, suffering means Leiden. Then they say, oh yes, there is an entry, but that is a Dutch city. That is a Dutch city, Leiden, but not what we are thinking about, Leiden as a form of human life. And this has to be brought into the categorical featuring of historical thinking, Leiden. And the other thing is what we have to integrate into our approach to historical experience is by asking for what it means to be a human being, what humanity as an integrative criteria of meaning means, we have to realize the inhumanity of humans as well. Only if we do this, then we have a starting point for a future directed historical thinking and the philosophy of history can help us to bring about this change in our thinking about the past as history. So I have come to an end of my presentation and um, I think that I could convince you that the task of the historians will become more difficult in doing this integration of inhumanity and suffering into our thinking. So at the end I would say, but there is a kind of making it easy again, namely by realizing that there is a fundamental grassroot humanism in all human life. And that is the last word I would like to present you in the form of this insight into a deep dimension of the human mind. And thank you very much, Sevao, for your translation. If you have understood something of my ideas, it is his merit and not mine. He made understandable language of a rather difficult form of philosophical reflection. Thank you very much. My pleasure.